Hello everyone, uh, we'll continue 2653 with turning and boring processes. Uh, so this is something that I actually am quite familiar with for a professor. I've uh, learned to use a lathe when I was in, well I guess I took this class a long time ago, somewhere around 2001. Uh, but then I was on the Formula SAE team and made a lot of parts on a lathe for part of that and have been using lathes and teaching people to use lathes ever since. So. Uh, quite a lot of experience for a professor anyway in, in this, so I'll try to add as much personal experience and anecdotes as I can to this. Uh, so, a lathe. Basics, uh, we've got a work piece, the thing we're trying to machine, turns, we have a stationary tool, and we make chips and remove material, subtract material uh, by a fixed holder and a rotating part. Uh, your engine lathe looks something like this. Uh, Essentially, it's going to be uh, there'll be a spindle motor which turns the spindle and turns the workpiece. There'll be some way of holding a tool, and then there'll be a, some way of moving the tools, and then there'll be some way, usually, of automating motion of uh, the tool too. So you don't have to sit there and crank it by by hand. I'll talk more about that later on. Um, so lathe basics, I. Uh, really not a lot has changed uh, as far as manual lathes go in quite a long time. Uh, in fact, you know, a lathe from the 1930s or 40s, as long as it's in good shape and has been taken care of, uh, is honestly perfectly fine for doing about anything you'd ever need to do with a manual lathe. Um, it really has not been any major technological advances past computer controlling these things, and that's really a whole separate class of machines nowadays. So uh, most lathes metalworking lace, they look basically the same. Uh, we'll get into some of the nomenclature here in a bit, uh, but really it's pretty standard for almost all lace. They make tiny lace, they make giant lace, but you know, they all work basically the same same way and have similar features. Uh, so I see most common, I don't know what the numbers are on that, uh, you know you don't have a machine shop unless you have a mill and a lathe. So uh, you need you need both of those things. You know to say it's the most common. I honestly don't know what the distribution looks like on machine shops, but uh, you you, you got to have both. You got to have a mill. You got to have a lathe. So I don't want to know if saying lathe is the most common is is that big of a deal. But uh, it's very very important to have a lathe in your shop. It's it's one of the fundamental machining tools. Uh, these things have been around a while, right? Industrial Revolution time time as part of it. Uh, we need to power these things, so having steam engines to power a lathe, it kind of all comes together. You know, if you've got, you're turning something to shape, it's been around a long time, but when you have some kind of an engine to turn the thing, uh, and you've got the ability to make nice rigid tooling, uh, it, it, the lathe is sort of an obvious extension in, of that. Uh, lathe manufacturing, uh, not a lot of companies, used to be a lot of big companies, especially here in the U.S., that made, made lathes, and uh, a lot of that's gone away, uh, gone overseas, uh, it's kind of sad, there's very few manufacturers of normal size uh, manual lathes here in the U.S. anymore, in fact, worldwide, there's probably not that many companies doing it, uh, so, I mean, honestly, a lot of our lathes are fairly old here at the school, and again, as long as you take care of them, they basically will last forever, so, uh, well, at least a few hundred years for sure. So, we've got some machines that are getting close to being 100 years old that, that uh, still work, work pretty well, and we've got some that have been tore up and don't work at all that are 20 or 30 years old. So, a lot of it's how you take care of equipment and how much you're doing with it. Uh, Common operations, mainly turning, right? We're, we're turning a part, we're running a tool into it, and we're removing material in the form of chips. Uh, so most of lathe work is turning. I, that's true in my experience. Uh, feed is typically from right to left. Usually when you look at a machine, the spindle will be on the left, the thing that's rotating the part will be on the left, uh, and you'll you move your cutter from right to left. Uh, you'll usually do some number of roughing cuts depending on how much material you need to remove uh, where you don't care that much about the uh, surface finish you care mainly about getting material off right if you've got a, if you're going to make some kind of a part that looks like this you need to remove all of this material as quickly as possible uh, and so you take deep cuts and you usually get bad surface finish from that or you use tools that have a uh, more aggressive tool that won't, it's just not capable of leaving a good surface finish. Uh, and then you try to do uh, one, maybe two or three finish cuts. Uh, 
a lot depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, so if I want to get a really precise, like, you know, let me draw that little goofy part again. So if I want to make something like this and I want to press a bearing on this thing and I need this diameter here to be accurate within a half a thousandth of an inch or so, uh, you know, trying to do that on a one-off part and trying to, to do one finish cut that's got somewhere around a 15,000th depth of cut uh, and trying to hit something that's that, uh, you're talking about more than an order of magnitude. Uh, not more than an order of magnitude. It's, it's what, three times bigger? Well, 15 thousandths. Yeah, yeah. More than an order of magnitude more. So, uh, actually it'd be 10, 30, so 30 times, right? So your, your, your tolerance is 30 times your depth of cut. So, uh, if you screw up that finish pass, uh, you're, you scrap your part. So, uh, you know, if you, if you try to get take 15 thousandths off so essentially you're going to be removing you know you're going to remove chunks of this and big cuts and then you're going to leave somewhere around 15 thousandths to do your finish cut on it and if you screw up that finish cut you, you scrap your part if you uh, machine it too small you can't make it bigger and if you leave like half a thousandth or a thousandth that you need to remove you can sometimes kind of do that for some materials uh, but you usually get a crap surface finish if you try to squeak off a half thousandth or a thousandth. It's, it's doable. I've done it before. Uh, there's different ways of doing it that are better than others. Uh, but it, it's not ideal. What you really want to do is have it so that last finish cut gets you right exactly where you want to be. And you've got good surface finish and, and everything works. You, you don't have to sit there and apply lots of weird machining tricks to try to get it get it to work right. So uh, I know what I normally do for trying to get a finish cut is I do my roughing cuts and then I leave enough material for two finish cuts. And I do one finish cut at my depth of cut I want, so like a 15 thousandths or a 10 thousandths depth of cut. Uh, and then I put a mic on it, a micrometer on it, and measure and see what that did. And uh, then just, just see how much, like if I put a desired depth of cut of 15 thousandths and it only cut 14 thousandths, then I'm going to plan that for my next cut. And if I if I need to, to remove 15 more thousandths, actually be 16 thousandths at that point, then I, I'd feed it, instead of feeding it 15 thousandths in, I'd feed it 16 thousandths in, assuming it's going to do the same thing again. So, uh, And that seems to be work, work pretty well, that method of doing roughing cuts and then leave, leave enough material for two finish cuts, do one finish cut, put a micrometer on your part and see, see what it did, and then make any adjustments to your next finish cut. That's what I do for any kind of bearing press fit or anything like that where I'm looking for half a thousand to a thousandth of an inch accuracy. Uh, I do that and it, it seems to work pretty well. I can I can hit half a thousand to a thousand pretty pretty easy on a on a good machine for doing bearing bearing presses. So uh, for CNC operations or when you're doing multiple parts and you got everything dialed in, you usually do all your roughing and then just one one light finish cut and, and you're good to go. But and that's if you're making a lot of parts and you can dial it in. Uh, if you're making a one off part with a manual machine, there's lots of little tricks to to do this right but usually there'll be roughing and then some some finishing or at least one finishing pass uh, boring boring is always a nightmare uh, so turning external turning is really pretty easy uh, you know removing material like this is fine when I've got something like uh, I don't know if I need to make a very precise bore in something and it's like not something I can drill you know if it's a if I needed a half inch bore that's great I use uh, this the the biggest drill bit I have under a half of an inch and then I use a half inch reamer and it'll hit a half inch within you know about as good tolerance as you can do on a lathe. Um, if I need to make like a 0.5355 hole or something goofy like that that's not a standard size and I need it to be accurate within a thousandth of an inch or so and there's not a perfect drill bit out there for me I, I've got to bore it. Uh, so Boring, you uh, it's the same process as external turning, except your tool is inside the bore, and you can see how that presents all sorts of interesting opportunities for things to go horribly wrong. Uh, you can run this thing in down here. You can't see where your tool's at, right? So you can't see it when it hits when it's going to hit the bottom out. Uh, and that's actually one of the better things that can go wrong. Uh, the worst is you accidentally move too far that way, and then really bad things usually usually happen. I mean, the best case scenario, you crap, you scrap your part. Uh, worst case scenario, or is bad in this, you can kick your the thing you're trying to machine out of the chuck. Uh, you can bend or break your boring bar, or all of the above, or just you don't want to you don't want to aggressively move the tool this way. I mean, you got to move it that way a little bit to remove material. 
Uh, but boring sucks, and I highly recommend not doing it unless you absolutely have to. Uh, usually boring bars have a long aspect ratio or high aspect ratio and that they're a lot longer than the, their diameter. Uh, so anything more than about three to one you start running into, uh, you have to be very careful about deflection of the tool and vibrations and you know, getting a good surface finish gets to be more difficult. Uh, how aggressive you can be with your cutting is, uh, you, you can't be very aggressive with, with a large aspect ratio boring bar. So uh, boring is un very unpleasant and so when you design parts, you should always try to design parts that don't need to be bored. You know, sometimes you have to, sometimes you need a, an oddball diameter inside. Sometimes you want to machine this to some really complicated shape that's got a fillet or a chamfer or something somewhere in it and you, you got to bore it. I mean there's those occasions where you have to bore. Uh, it's just a lot more more difficult than than uh, than external turning. Threading, uh, cutting external threads or internal threads. Internal threads you want to use a die or sorry a tap if you can. Uh, external threads you might might cut. Uh, external threading on a lathe is an art in and of itself. It's something that I, I also hate doing is external threads. Uh, there's a trick to it that I mean I, there's literally no way I could explain it in a video you'd have to see at some point so uh, but external threading it can be done on a manual lathe they're set up for it they'll have some way of uh, uh, they'll basically have a feed uh, uh, the word I'm looking for it's in a slide coming up but there'll be a, a, a threaded like an Acme threaded bar that's driven off the spindle and it'll have usually more than one start. Four starts is pretty common and four starts means there's the threads on it are actually interlaced and don't so if you get started on one set of threads it only runs on that set of threads. If you get started on another set of threads it'll run on that set of threads and not in, it'll never get onto the other set of threads and so four starts mean there's four different places you can engage those threads and there'll be this goofy little dial that spins it's got four little marks on it and you need to lock it in to the same mark each time you want to so you'll do a pass to remove a little bit of this material for threads and you'll do another pass deeper and another pass deeper and each time you do a pass you've got to lock it into the same start on the the, the feed try it for your feed rod I can't remember what it's called it's coming up in the slide but uh, you have to get the machine locked into the same start on the threads and it's it's stressful I don't know what else to say I've crashed a couple of lathes doing that that before uh, some of you though who have done a lot of machining are laughing at me right now. It's all right. It's a pain. It's a pain to do external threading, but it's doable. Uh, once you've got it figured out, it actually works pretty well. Facing. That's when I wanted to cut this facing surface here. That's usually about the easiest thing to do. Uh, good surface finish. As long as your tool height is set up correctly, facing is, is very very easy. Uh, if your tool is too low or too high, you can get have have issues. Uh, if it's too low, you usually get a little nub left. If it's too high, it doesn't cut very well, and it might do bad things when it gets to the center. It might kick the part up or down or in a weird direction. I've seen people bend their parts uh, by the stress of just trying to smush that nub off. So if your tool's way up here, you're not going to cleanly cut to the center of this thing. It's going to try to smash the end of this off, and it might bend your workpiece or break your tool or both. Uh, so tool height is really important when you're when you're facing and, and turning too, but especially facing. Uh, drilling holes, reaming holes, tapping holes, knurling, all, all pretty common things. Uh, major components, uh, the bed, these things, is so you're turning something that might not be perfectly concentric, so that's, if it's not perfectly concentric, but the center mass is not on the axis, the rotation is going to vibrate, you need a heavy machine for turning. So uh, these machines uh, make liberal use of cast iron. Uh, it's strong and it's heavy and it's cheap, so it's really the perfect material for making a lathe out of. So uh, these things are usually god awful heavy, uh, and they're also fairly tall and then fairly short this direction. So they they can be a little unstable too. So that you can make sure they're they're level on the ground. Uh, you might even attach it to the ground either with screws uh, or like threaded big threaded rods or even glue them to the ground. Some some places will glue machines to the to the ground using some kind of adhesive that they can get off later. Uh, but you know, usually they're heavy enough that they don't don't go anywhere. Uh, that's, so the bed is the big heavy casting at the bottom. Again, these are almost always just a big chunk of cast iron. Very few exceptions, especially for any lathe you'd actually want to use. Um, so this this part won't be cast very precisely. So you need a very precise thing to control the carriage movement here. And so that's going to be the ways. Ways are going to be hardened precision ground steel, uh, and those will usually be 
Uh, I've seen some lathes where that's part of the bed, and they they just they use an alloy that they can they can heat treat and harden, and then grind so the ways are, are part of the bed. Sometimes the ways are a separate thing that's that's uh, mechanically connected to the, the bed somehow. Uh, but the ways need to be very hard and precision ground. Hard so they don't wear. If they wear, then that ruins your precision. Uh, and they need to be precise because any 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 goofiness and the straightness of, of the ways is going to get translated into the motion of the carriage. And ultimately the tool will affect the accuracy of the machine, precision of the machine, I should say. Uh, you need a motor to turn this whole thing, uh, 5 to 25 horsepower. I mean, it gets smaller than that, it gets bigger than that. There's all sorts of different sizes of lathes for different applications. The main thing to note in this that, that's interesting and not covered a lot. I mean, you, you hear lathes are dangerous a lot, but uh, if you're a farmer or worked in the agricultural industry, you know how dangerous things like PTO shafts are. And you might have a 30 or 40 horsepower tractor, and the PTO shaft on that can put out you know, somewhere around half to 75% of that much power, depending on what you're doing. Uh, lathes can have similar amounts of power on something that's spinning like a PTO shaft at actually faster speeds than a PTO shaft, and you're putting your nose about six inches away from it. So uh, these things are very powerful machines and uh, will do very bad things to you if, if you get into them. So you have to be incredibly careful careful, careful around lathes. Uh, there's just mainly a few practices on that that I'm sure you've heard at some point in time, but uh, mainly uh, long clothing, that's and long hair and things like that anything that can get wrapped up around the spindle that's what you really need to avoid uh, because the power of the machine it can just pull it'll pull your hair in it will pull your clothes in and then it pulls you in and then you die in horribly graphic ways so um, you know if you're if you have your sleeves rolled back if you have your hair tied back you know don't have long hair uh, and you, there's nothing really that can get caught in this thing as it goes around. The, the kinds of injuries are, are very limited and usually very, very minor. I mean, you can cut yourself, you can break a bone or you know, your finger or, or do something like that, uh, you know, or throw a splinter off and lose an eye if you're not wearing safety glasses. But they're relatively minor injuries compared to getting pulled into a five horsepower machine and, and killed in a horrible way. So, uh, so there's there's a few basic things if you follow it. These these aren't unsafe to run. You just there's certain precautions you have to take that you you just never you, there's things you just never do when using a lathe. And uh, as long as you do those things or don't do those things, the things you shouldn't do, you're, it's relatively safe to use these things. Uh, and these will be you'll need some kind of a speed reduction usually. So you need to drop the speed and increase the torque. You know, motors will spin at a few thousand RPM. You need to, these things to spin down to maybe 100 RPM, maybe up to a few thousand RPM. So you need some way of changing the, the gear ratio. So that'll be done with sprockets, pulleys, uh, chains, uh, or belts on pulleys, chains on sprockets, or, or gears. Uh, gears are usually the higher end lathes. Uh, the lathes you want usually are probably going to be a, a gear, all gear head or a gear head lathe. That's usually what you want, where all, all of the, the speed and torque changing is done with, with gears. Uh, that's going to usually work better, at least in my experience, than, than belts or chains. Some of the smaller cheaper lathes might use belts or chains, but gears are pretty well what you want. They're reliable. Gears, as long as you keep them lubricated and don't, don't abuse them, they'll last essentially forever. Uh, the headstock assembly, that's here. That's usually going to be where uh, uh, the, the gear, some of the gears will be. Uh, that'll be the main bearings for the spindle. Uh, this it says it's fixed. It is fixed, but it usually has some ability to be adjusted, so you can make sure the center line of this thing is where you want it. So there'll usually be some way of loosening this and adjusting it, and then locking it down. Uh, again, geared for several rotational speeds, but on some ways it might be a series of pulleys. Uh, hollow spindle. This is usually hollow, so you can put bar stock through it. It'll have some piece of equipment for holding your tool, or sorry, holding your uh, workpiece. Uh, chuck's common, collet's common, there's some other ways of doing it too. Uh, these will usually be specified, there'll be like some diameter, they'll tell you, there'll be a, some specification for a lathe that tells you how big a piece of stock you can, you can put through the, the clear, the through hole that goes all the way through the headstock. Uh, you got to watch it, you know, if you can't, you don't want to put like a 20 foot bar of steel on this thing and turn it on. I've seen people screw this one up. Uh, this thing will be spinning around in a circle and, you know, can get out of line and start whipping around. And then when this starts, like gets bent and then starts whipping around, it is incredibly dangerous. 
Uh, it's one of those things you just don't do. So there's some reasonable amount. Usually, again, that three to one's pretty good. Uh, you know, you want about, well, I don't know. So it's probably, yeah, I don't know. You don't want something to stick too far out the back. So there'll be some provision for it, uh, but it's something at some point in time, this is going to cause a problem. Uh, carriage, a solid foundation for holding the tool. So this is the carriage right here. Carriage slides on the ways. That forms one of your linear axes. This is usually the Z axis is what that's called. Uh, tail stock here. This would be for holding a part with the center, which is a, a little, basically little thing that grabs the center of the part and guides it. So for some long bar, it keeps it from deflecting here at the end. Uh, also holds uh, drill chucks, uh, boring some boring bars, things like that. Uh, drilling, tapping, center is the main use for the tailstock. Uh, all right, ways, tailstock. Let's see, you got your carriage, you got your cross slide, which forms your other axis. Most lathes are two axis, Z axis. So this would be Z, this would be X. Uh, this one's got a compound. A compound is a separate um, slide that you can adjust the angle on. You release some kind of... Uh, There'll be some, some nuts or something that you back off and you can rotate that thing and there'll be some kind of an angle indicator on it. And there'll be a separate little little crank handle that will control the compound. So for cutting uh, bevels and chamfers and things like that, compounds work, work nicely. Um, there'll be a tool post that will hold the whatever kind of tool you're going to use, uh, different kinds of those. Um, and then there'll ultimately be the tool that you're, you're moving around. Lead screw, that's the thing I couldn't think of the name of before. But the lead screw will be connected through some gear ratio to the motor that's turning the spindle. Uh, the ratio will be adjustable. You can change that to change how fast your machine, the, your X and Z will move when you have it set to move uh, automatically. Uh, it'll also change your, your thread pitch if you're doing threading with it. Um, some machines have a separate lead screw and feed rod. Uh, on bigger machines, some machines, everything's done by the lead screw. The One of the lathes we've got in the student machine shop, everything's done with the lead screw. So all you do is change the ratio of the lead screw to, to change that. Uh, you move the carriage by turning the carriage hand wheel. You move the cross slide by turning the cross slide hand wheel, and that's how you control the X and Z position. And there'll be another hand wheel on the uh, compound itself. I think I've covered everything here. Lead screw, uh, used for cutting threads on machines that have a separate lead screw and feed rod. Uh, this will be geared directly to the spindle. So if you're talking about threads per inch, it will make it so that when this thing rotates, it will move the cross slide uh, however many threads for per inch of movement. So, uh, so if it's eight threads per inch, then this will make eight revolutions for each inch of travel. And so you can work out the gear ratios required for that. These will be listed on the machine. There'll be some way of adjusting this or these ratios with uh, usually levers of some kind. You'll set the ratio on it and it'll be listed like if you want a 32 thread per inch pitch, uh, you put the handles in this configuration and then it will make it so when you engage the carriage to the feed rod, or sorry, carriage to the, the lead screw, it will feed in the, the correct amount. There'll be a separate set of handles on the apron. The aprons is part here. There'll be a separate set of handles. One will lock the carriage hand wheel to the lead screw. One will lock the cross feed lead screw, cross slide feed, the cross slide hand wheel to the lead screw. And so there'll be two levers. One locks it in so it moves in the Z direction automatically. One locks it in so it moves in the X direction automatically. You usually don't do both at the same time. It's it's one or the other. Uh, feed rod, that provides power feed for the carriage and cross sliding. And some machines, these are separate. Some of the machines, these are the same. I've seen both. Uh, but this anyway, either way, you know, you'll have a lever that will automatically move the carriage in the Z direction. You'll have a lever that automatically moves it in the X direction. Uh, so, Sometimes those are the same lever that you move in different directions, depends on the machine. There'll also be some way of locking, since this lead screw will have different starts, there'll be some way of guaranteed it gets locked into uh, a specific one of the starts. And there'll be some little indicator, usually it's a little wheel that's got little markings on it that spins. And uh, there'll be some separate little clutch that you engage to make sure that, like, when, when, again, there'll be some little wheel. It'll have some markings on it for the different starts. 
there'll be some fixed mark. So if you want to lock it into the second start, there'll be some kind of a lever that you'll engage when these things become aligned, and that'll guarantee you you're in the same start. If you start threading and taking multiple passes and, and engage it to the lead screw at different starts, then the threads will all be in different locations, and it's just a complete mess, and you scrap your part. So, uh, and this is more of an art form. You really need to, to see somebody do it and learn learn from them to do it to do it correctly. Uh, you got your gearbox or a bunch a whole bunch of pulleys too, uh, but gearbox is what you want. Uh, apron that's where all your controls on your carriage are. Uh, these look fairly complicated and can be kind of intimidating on on some machines. Carriage uh, here's a close up of the carriage. It's going to ride on the ways. It's going to have the cross slide, so this would be the Z, this is going to be the X, uh, I don't have the directions correct on those. Usually it's, i got to remember, Z is usually positive out, and I believe X is positive out as well, I don't, so Z would be plus that way, and then X would be plus that way, I believe. It's been a, I always forget coordinate systems on machines, and I have to figure it out when I start doing CNC stuff. Uh, but I usually, that's, I get like a year off and forget everything and have to relearn everything. But a lot of it's kind of like riding a bike. You, you know, if you've done it before, you don't really forget it. It just takes a little bit of work to, to get back where you were. Uh, anyway, here's your hand wheels. This would be for your cross slide. This would be for your compound. Uh, these little nuts here, you'd loosen those, and that would allow you to rotate your compound. There'll be a little, little protractor-like angle guide on it. Uh, this is an older style tool post. Uh, you don't see these anymore. You don't want one of these on a new machine. These are a giant pain in the ass. Uh, you see them on some older machines. You can also retrofit. This T-slot will be pretty standard, and you can retrofit a better tool post holder on those. Uh, here's the little threading dial. That's the thing I was talking about. It's got the markings, so four markings for the different starts. Uh, and then there'll be a fixed mark and when the marking for a starts aligned with this then you're, you're guaranteed to be on on the right start each time you engage on the lead screw and there'll be a separate clutch for engaging that it'll be a separate lever for engaging that uh, ways you can move it will be Z X and compound on most most machines uh, boring you're gonna be basically feeding the tool in where it needs to go and then feeding it so in the X and then in in the Z uh, and then backing out in the Z and then feeding it back out a little bit for your next cut uh, facing you're going to get the Z where you need to go and then you're going to feed in in the X and then retract in the X uh, cut off you're going to feed where you're going to go in the Z and then you're going to feed in on uh, on the X until you've moved the tool past the center line uh, so facing is pretty pretty simple you just get your depth of cut set from the surface so this would be your, your depth of cut here and then you feed smoothly in uh, you, sometimes you do this by hand it's usually you're always going to get a better surface finish if you have the the cross slide or the carriage uh, driven by the lead screw uh, it's going to be moving at a consistent rate you get a consistent surface finish it's hard to turn these these wheels at a consistent exact speed you know the more you've done it the better you get at it but i usually are going to use the power feed in the x or z direction for for facing or uh or uh, just outside turning maybe even boring too but you got to watch crash in the boring bar in the bottom of the hole uh cut off everyone hates cut off uh or parting it just You've got a really thin tool uh, that usually has a pretty high aspect ratio, especially for parting off something big. And there's just the, the feeds and speeds have to be perfect for this to get the, the right kind of chip. Uh, the part can actually ride up on the tool and you can bend the workpiece and then it spins around in a circle and bent and breaks your tool and breaks your part and does all sorts of bad things. Uh, I've even seen people knock the whole alignment of the, the head of a lathe out. By screwing up parting, uh, someone really and broke a three-jaw chuck actually by screwing screwing up parting. So parting is usually fairly stressful. Uh, if you've got a hole through the part, parting's not bad. It's usually when you're trying to part something really really sturdy like 4340 steel or something like that, uh, and and you're parting all the way through solid and you don't have a hole or anything like that. And it gets down to the end, it gets it gets a little touchy at times. Uh, if everything's perfect, you can usually do cut off with power feed. Most people usually like to do cut off manually just because you get it, you kind of need to, to 
let the, the chip formation guide you and you can kind of keep it from getting angry sometimes. Uh, parting is usually fairly stressful, but uh, facing and, and turning are fine. Boring is pretty stressful too. Uh, tail stock, so you, you can do a center. So a center is just a, to guide a long part so you can prevent it from flailing around and prevent it from deflecting. Uh, this will usually have two castings. It'll ride on the waves. There'll be a lower and upper casting. There'll be some way of adjusting those so you can make sure your center line's just right. Uh, there'll be two levers. Uh, one will lock the quill. The quill is the movable part out here. One will lock the quill and prevent it from moving in or out. And then this hand will heal here will allow you to, to move the quill in and out. Uh, and then one will lock this whole piece to the ways. So there'll be one that locks the quill and then one that locks the whole tail stock to the ways. And so like for drilling, you would unlock this handle and move this where you want it. Then you'd lock this handle, uh, unlock this handle, and then use the, the hand wheel here to move the quill in and out. If you're using centers, you'd use the hand wheel to get the center engaged and then you'd lock both levers uh, so, that, so that nothing moved. Uh, size uh, swing is essentially the maximum diameter that can be turned so 12 to 24 inches is common it gets smaller it gets bigger I mean you, up to 50 it gets bigger than that I mean if you're machining a crankshaft for a giant shipping container ship it, it's gonna be big it's gonna be might even be bigger than 50 inches it might be 100 inches it might be even bigger there's some vid big big lights videos out there on YouTube if you're interested uh, distance between centers, that's the maximum part that can be turned mounted by centers. I'll talk about that in a second. 4 to 12 feet is typically going to get smaller than that. It gets bigger than that depending on what, what you're machining. You know, at some point in time they had to machine uh, gun barrels that were like, I don't know, whatever, 50, 16 inches times 50. Uh, so that's 800 inches. Uh, that's how long the gun barrel were, like the actual barrel part of the guns on the Iowa class battleships, and not counting the other extensions of that. So, I mean, that, that's a big thing that had to be turned, and it requires a big, big lathe. Uh, spindle speeds up to 4,000, I don't know, it, it varies depending on what you're doing. You know, anywhere from tens of RPM to tens of thousands of RPM. Uh, this is one of the things you can screw up if you're machining like a big giant part and you screw up your spindle speed and have it spinning really, really fast, you can turn the machine on and, and spin the part so fast it becomes unstable and gets launched out of the chuck. Uh, so you gotta make sure your speeds are set correctly before you before you start start turning something. Some of those things you just set it and then slow it down and to get it where you go. You need to make sure your, your spindle speeds are right. Uh, and metalworking engine lathe is the most common lathe. I have no idea what that means. Uh, but an engine lathe is the most common type of lathe. A tool room lathe, if you've ever seen that, it's usually a, a more precise lathe. It's still an engine lathe, but it's a more precise, smaller lathe for making small parts. So if you wanted to buy a lathe for like your home shop or something, a tool room lathe would be a good, good lathe for a home shop. Uh, turret lathe, there's different kinds. These are usually different ways of indexing tools. And th you know, these aren't CNC yet. Uh, you know, all of these things, I guess, can be CNC. Uh, but you can make a manual lathe that's got a ram uh, or a saddle or a, or a slant bed for indexing different tools in. But a lot of this gets more important for CNC machines. Uh, vertical lathe, you see some of those big vertical axis lathes for really, really big parts. Uh, screw machines get pretty interesting for mass production. Uh, turret lathe, uh, the turret's just some some way of indexing different tools. This is a better view here where here's a hexagon turret where you got six different tool stations and you'll have some way of rotating this thing and locking it down and then usually there'll be a big giant hand wheel here for moving this whole thing on a ram. So this would be a ram turret lathe. Uh, on a regular manual machine you might have a four-way uh, tur turret. This is my uh, like for a manual machine, I prefer having a little four-way turret here uh, where you can uh, you can lock this thing down in one position with one tool. You can unlock it, rotate it, and it'll index in at 90 degrees, and you can lock it back in. So you can put different tools in there, and you don't have to sit there and change tools each time. You can just rotate this thing and lock it in. Those work pretty nice. Uh, usually not too expensive. You know, RAM turrets like this, get it, it's part of the machine. It's not something you'd add on to a machine. Or maybe you could, but it'd be pretty, pretty hard to find something for particular machine after after you've already got it. Um, so here's a picture of a RAM turret. You can see the turret here, the RAM here. This is the feed for the RAM. Uh, so you, you've you got still got the regular carriage 
setup here, but it's got this additional turret here instead of a tailstock uh, where you can put different different tooling in here, rotate it to index it, and then use this big wheel to feed the RAM in. Here's another one here, pretty similar. And here's a CNC turret lathe, so it's actually a slant bed, so the bed is actually at an, at an angle here. Uh, and then there'll be a turret that's automatically indexed to, to set up different tooling. Uh, Swiss screw machines are really cool, so uh, this isn't the best diagram for it, but if you just search for Swiss screw machine on YouTube, You'll find, hopefully, you'll find something for this class and not something horrible else, but for something else. But anyway, uh, the main difference between a Swiss style machine and, and a knot is, uh, so you've got your chuck that holds whatever it is you're trying to machine. And in a Swiss screw machine, so in a regular machine, the, the jaws, the chuck hold, hold your tool piece in, golly, hold your work piece in. And the workpiece does can't move in this direction. In a Swiss screw machine, uh, there's actually a separate feed that can slide the workpiece in and out. Uh, and so essentially, what you do is you put all your tools right up against the chuck. And instead of having a, a z-axis that you can, instead of moving a carriage on the z-axis, you actually move the part in and out uh, through the spindle chuck. And machine right as close to the chuck as you can this limits deflection so on a regular on a regular lathe you know we might be working let me get a picture out here so your the part's going to be that your machine is going to extend out of the spindle and if you're machining it down here there's a lot sticking out it might be very flexible and it might bend uh, if you're machining it right up against the chuck it might work fine because it's, it's just a lot, lot more rigid um, with a Swiss screw machine, you're working as close to the chuck as possible, and so you you don't have to worry as much about deflection when you're cutting. There's a whole lot of innuendo in this lecture, by the way. I'm, I apologize for that. Uh, here's a brown and sharp screw machine, and all you're doing all your work right up against the, the chuck. Uh, so there's not a lot of deflection. Again, these are this is a lot of really fun videos on, of this on on YouTube. Uh, this says movement guided by a camshaft. Sure, the old mechanical ones were, but these are going to be mainly CNC nowadays. Uh, Multi-spindle screw machines. Now we're starting to get really, really expensive where we've got multiple spindles all doing different operations, and we can rotate this little turret here. And it, Yeah, these are expensive, expensive, complicated machines, especially the old school mechanical ones. Uh, Multi-spindle procedure, in this case, like for this, you've got one, two, see about six different workstations so for this part here we're making these little gizmos here we might have uh, one position that roughs the outer contour with a form uh, and spot drills and then the next one we're going to finish the outer profile and we're going to face and then drill uh, here we're going to drill with a separate bit here we're going to do a little bit more machining on the outside uh, we're going to ream uh, here we're going to do a tapping operation, here we're going to do a cutoff. We'd have six different stations and we'd have a part being worked on in each station at each time and you can sit there and knock these things out super, super quick. Uh, they make these all mechanical, like this would be an all mechanical one. Uh, they make them CNC machine too. I mean, all mass production at that point. So something I don't personally have a lot of experience with. I've never done mass production on lathe parts before. So. Uh, but you see more more in industries where you're making lots of little mechanical widgets at a time. A couple videos here. I'll try to post links to some different ones. Uh, work holding devices. Uh, so chucks are pretty common. Three jaw, four jaw, six jaw. I'll talk more about that in a second. Uh, for bar stock, you use collets. Collets are almost always preferable to a chuck if you can. Uh, they tend to hold things centered better so I prefer using a collet if possible. They make round ones, square ones, and hexagons too. Uh, rounds are by far the most most common ones. Uh, faceplate mounting, if you need to bore something in you know, some weird shape, you need to mount it and turn it and you know, make a faceplate like a big a big plate that's got the regular Tico style clamps where you've got kind of a little step here and then you've got a little triangle shaped piece here. There's a little nut for tightening this down. And then you use those Tico clamps to clamp down your workpiece. And you use two or three of them. It looks a little scary when they all go together. I've had to bore some uh, uprights for a formula car that, that had to clamp them in a lathe with 
on a big face plate with Tico clamps and bore the bearing bores on them and it, it works fine it's just a pain to set up uh carriage mounted i don't see too many of those um so chucks three jaws really common these three jaws will be all keyed together uh so when you turn a little square shape hole usually using a big t handle uh you turn that and there will be a spiral in here these are all keyed together and move move in and out and self-center so if they're adjusted correctly, they self-center. For anything round, that's what you want to use. Uh, if you're machining something that's not round, uh, or if you need to machine off-center for something that is round, you can use a four jaw here. Each four, each of these jaws moves independently, uh, and so you can uh, use a dial indicator to to spin this thing and move these things to get something centered where where you need it. Uh, these are usually heavy and they're expensive and they're, they're a precision thing and they can be, be broken, they can be damaged and have to be replaced uh, and they can be kind of a booger to, to swap out on machines because they get, they get really heavy really really quick and they can be finger mashers when you're, when you're putting them in or replacing them. Uh, generally you want to use a three jaw if you can. They make six jaws too that hold a little bit better but are more expensive. Three jaws are real common. Four jars, jaws when you need to center something off center on a round part or chuck in something that's not, not round. Uh, you can turn between centers where you have a dead center, which is just a chunk of metal that's tapered, that's turned in the spindle. And then you have a live center, which goes into the tail stock that's got a bearing and a center here that that turns with the part. Uh, this is not going to provide enough torque to turn the part, so you'll need a dog and a dog plate. Uh, so the dog plate will be connected to the spindle, and then the dog will be connected to the part and that will provide the torque that turns this thing. If we're turning really like a long half shaft or something like that, or long axle shaft, something like that, uh, this, this might work, work pretty well. You usually want to turn the three jaw and a center on one end if you can, but, but sometimes you can't. So I've never actually turned anything with a dog like this before. I've always been able to or design things to be able to hold them with a chuck on one end and a center on the other if necessary. Uh, they make steady rests that if you need to support something in the middle, they'll make a big rest that'll have three different little bearings that will go in and touch the part and then that will be mounted down to the ways to support something long. Uh, they make follow rests which are the same concept but it will be connected to the carriage and move with the carriage. Uh, I've never heard of a tracer, I don't know what it is. Uh, quick change tool post. Uh, that's what I prefer on almost all machines nowadays where you'll have some kind of a cam and you can lock tools in and out and swap tools really quickly. Uh, the old school tool posts, let me get way back here. These old school tool posts are a giant pain in the ass and you have to uh, chuck a tool into it, get it all set up, get the height set up on it and uh, and uh, get the, and if, if you put a different tool in there, the angle, the heights are going to change and you have to set up every tool each time you put it in. It's a giant pain. Quick change tool posts, you just undo a cam, put a new tool in, lock it in and it's back exactly where, you know, if you replace a tool and put it back in, it's exactly where it was before, before you took it out. So. Quick change is pretty well where you want to be on any kind of manual machine. And all the CNC machines will have some kind of quick change tooling that varies depending on what kind of machine it is. Uh, pneumatic collet holders will just make it easier to swap collets in and out. Boring machines here we're spinning the part and moving a tool in. Uh, but this is for giant, big, heavy parts. Uh, the, these usually, usually rotate fairly slowly, usually for boring operations and, and big, heavy parts. Uh, still kind of lathe because the, the work piece is turning. You can see this, the big, big chuck down here. And then the tool is stationary. So this would be a, actually a big ram collet, sorry, ram turret uh, boring machine. Uh, here's another one here. This would be uh, another boring machine, not a ram turret. If you know, it's got a ram, it just doesn't have a turret. Uh, again, it's, it's a big, big lathe turned on its end. So this thing's 40 horsepower, which guys, a ton of power. Cutting forces can be insane on that. Here's a horizontal boring machine, and this this is sort of it's still it's still a lathe, uh, but it's primarily designed for boring in parts. So this is specialized for making big, big, precise holes and things. All right, so that's it for today. Uh, this material will be on the next quiz. I will see you all next week. Thank you.